he was the biggest, uh, uh, he had the best private collection, art collection in the world when he was alive. That collection can be seen today in Lisbon, in the Gulbenkian Museum. And um, he left us a foundation, the Gulbenkian Foundation. It is set in Lisbon. It's the fifth biggest foundation in the world. Um, it works almost as a cultural ministry in Portugal. A lot of Portuguese have access to culture through the Gulbenkian Foundation. So you could, for example, you could see the the Bolshoi, they went to Portugal, it was the Gulbenkian Foundation who brought them. And they would, they would bring, you know, uh, performing arts from Japan, from Mongolia, from wherever. We had them in Portugal, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the years of dictatorship especially, when it was uh, difficult to, to have access to, to culture. So it was important. Also, the Gulbenkian touched the lives of many Portuguese because he had these um, libraries on, on wheels. I mean, there was a bus, it was actually a library, and it, go, it would go to village, from village to village to bring books to people. So people, would, the, 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 the library would arrive at the place, and you would, you would uh, get the book, and they would go to some other place, and in one week they would come back, and you had to, to give back the book. So it works like that. And a lot of people had access to books because of uh, Gulbenk, and even in my, my personal life, um, my, I was born in Mozambique, that was Portuguese Africa, Eastern Africa, and uh, my father was a doctor. Uh, and um, he had the responsibility, uh, you know, Mozambique is a huge, huge place, you know, the southern tip, if the southern tip was in Lisbon, the northern tip would be in Paris, so you can see how big Mozambique is. And his regional area, his district was that, is, is as big as Belgium and Holland together, and there were only five doctors to take care of, the, of, of all these people. So he came up with an idea of getting a plane and flying from village to village to bring health to people, okay? Vaccination campaigns and all, all that stuff. And guess who paid for the plane? The sure. Gulbenkian Foundation. So it touched my life too. The, the lives of every Portuguese, directly or indirectly, was touched by Gulbenkian. So that's why he was the most famous <laughs> Armenian ever that uh, we heard of. Actually, it was the only one, because <laughs> later on we, le we learned about the Kardashians. <laughs> so, um, I had to write that book, and, uh, because we knew about him, but we actually did not know him. Everybody knew him, and no nobody knew him. So I came up with a, with a book, and um, so let's, let, let's, let's start and, and tell this story. Um, Kalus Sarkis Gobenkian was born in Skutari, which is um, in, uh, in uh, southern, you know, it's in the Asian side of Istanbul, uh, then it was called Constantinople. And um, then he, uh, he, his father, he became a very important man in Trebzond, in the Black Sea, which is, Trebzond still is in Turkey now. Um, and uh, he grew up there. Eventually, uh, his father, got into a funny business. He was a businessman. He would, uh, he would uh, have trades on rugs and stuff, a lot of, a lot of different things. And then there was a, a new product that uh, came over for lightning, you know, to illuminate houses, which was a, a, a new product. It was an oil that came from the rocks. And you know how to say rock in, in, in Latin. It is Petra. So it was Petra oil. Okay? Petra. Uh, okay, oil. And so uh, it was a derivation of, of petrol oil, which was kerosene that he brought from America. And he became the exclusive, um, uh, the, the exclusive distributor of, of kerosene in the Ottoman Empire, especially for the Sultan, because he had some links. And of course, there was a lot of bribery going on to get this uh, exclusivity, exclu exclusivity. And um, so uh, Gubeng, that's how the family got in touch with the oil business through, uh, through America. He became a representative of Rockefeller and all that uh, American oil. Then he, they moved to, to Constantinople and he became a banker, Gobenkin's father. Not a big banker. You know, uh, Armenians, I came to realize, are uh, what I would call the Christian Jews. Um, in a Christian world, uh, 
Jews are the bankers. Why? Not because they have some genetic... Uh, they are, the, 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 being a banker is in their genes. No, it's because the Christians, for religious purposes, would not touch banks. Interest rates and all that stuff, it was forbidden. Okay? So it was left for the Jews. In the Ottoman Empire, for the same reason, the Muslims would not touch banks. So they left it to, to, to the Armenians. So the, you understand? That's, that's how the Armenians got involved in the banking business. They were the bankers of, of the Ottoman Empire. And his father he became a, a small banker. And, and he, he grew up here in, in, in Constantinople. He was, he was attending an American school uh, that was Robert College. still exists. Now it's a university. Robert College was very important in the 19th century because that's where all the Christians went. And that's from where the all independence movements in Rumelia, which was the European Ottoman Empire, uh, were born. You know, like, for example, all the leaders of Bulgaria, they grew up, they, they, they attended the Robert College. They learned these ideas from France about freedom and independence and all that stuff. It was growing in Robert College. Uh, guys, you know, uh, students from Serbia, Greeks, and they were learning all that in Robert College. I go back and attend at Robert College. Uh, and of course, this is a period, 19th century. A lot of countries are becoming independent from the Ottoman Empire with these revolutions. Uh, Christian countries, of course, uh, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Greece, um, and of course, the Armenians had some aspirations as well. But that's a different story, which uh, is, is related to this story anyway. Uh, after, uh, after Robert College, he goes to France, to Marseille, and then he moves to the university in England, in London. He takes a degree in engineering uh, in, at uh, uh, King's College. And his uh, final dissertation is about technology of oil. He was interested in oil, so he studies that. He goes back, he actually, uh, while he was in London, you realize that the biggest banker in the Ottoman Empire, an Armenian called Essayan, was there, and he had a daughter. Okay, so this was a very rich man, Mr. Essayan. He was the owner of the biggest bank in the Ottoman Empire, and he was the the, the owner of the Pera Palace Hotel. It still exists. The Pera Palace Hotel was built. It was the first luxury hotel in the Ottoman Empire. It was built for the Orient Express. It's, it was on, in that hotel that Agatha Christie wrote Murder on the Orient Express. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, it was Mr. Essayan was the owner of that hotel. And of course, being so rich, Kobankian decided that he had to marry his daughter. <laughs> and of course he was doing courtship, not to the daughter, but to the, to, to the banker. You know, so, so to show that it was normal in those days. Now it's a bit maybe funny and shocking, but in those days it was normal. So, I mean, I, in the book I tell the entire story, how he does uh, things, but eventually he convinces uh, Mr. Essayan that he's the right man, and he marries Navart Essayan. So uh, she becomes Navart Gobenkian, and he gets into business. Then he comes back to, to Constantinople, and in Constantinople, the, sult uh, the, the sultan... Uh, he realizes, you know, there was a big business going on in those days, which actually is one of the causes of the, of the Great War. It, it's when the Germans got to build the, 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 the train line, the Anatolian train line, okay, from Constantinople to Baghdad. Okay, the, the British were very worried with this because it meant they could attack India, okay? So the, the, the German engineers were doing this, and uh, the, 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 the Turkish, they realized that the, there, was, there was some funny business going on with oil. That actually the Germans, that's what the Turkish spies were telling the, the Sultan, the, the Germans were actually looking for oil places. Because in those days, oil was becoming more and more important and the Germans didn't have it. The British had it, the Dutch had it, the Americans had it, but they didn't. So it was a, a, a big problem then. And uh, the Sultan, you see, he looked around and said, who's the biggest, who's uh, the, the best um, man who knows more things about oil in the entire Ottoman Empire? Oh, there's actually this guy who took it, uh, made a dissertation at King's College. So that's the guy. So he asks Gulbenkian to, 
to make a prospection of what are, are the oil possibilities of the oil. When he's about to, to leave, his father said, where are you going? Well, I'm going to, to Mesopotamia to, to find out what's going on on oil. He said, are you crazy? Do you know how many bandits are on the roads? Do you, uh, uh, there are no toilets. Uh, you know, Gobenkin was a man who loved luxury. Mm -hmm. So he started thinking, hey, he is right, you know, it's a dangerous place to go. It was not, not stupid. It's a dangerous place, very uncomfortable. Why should I go? So what he actually did, he bribed some uh, German uh, engineers to give him information about what they were finding. And then he wrote a report as if he had done it and he delivered to the Sultan. So very, uh, that's how he did his report. Of course, he didn't gain anything out of it because the Sultan only thanked him, said, oh, you, you did a, a great job, a great work for your Sultan. And uh, in the, he ended up uh, buying all, the Sultan, he bought all the lands that were uh, a perspective for the, for the oil. But of course, he did nothing about it because he, he had no knowledge uh, of things. Anyway, uh, what happens was, after this, there were, we are talking about 1890s, 1890s. Uh, there was a, a big persecution of Armenians then. You know, sometimes it would erupt in some places and uh, usually in the countryside, not in Constantinople. In the countryside, they would persecute uh, the, the Armenians, the Christians in general, and the Armenians specifically. They would persecute also the Greeks and the Bulgarians, and all, but the, you know, they, they had a neck on the Armenians especially. And there was one of these situations, they were, they were persecuted and killing a lot of people, especially in the Adana area. And in this uh, instance, they actually attacked in Constantinople. Usually they didn't do it, only in the countryside. Why? Because there were many foreigners in Constantinople. And they, they didn't like to do it in front of the foreigners. So it was for an Armenian relatively safe to be in Constantinople. But in that particular instance, the massacres took place also in Constantinople. And Gulbenkian, he realized, I cannot live in a country like this. So, during the, the massacre, he got his, he had a son already, a Nubar, um, and he put him in a rug, inside a rug, okay? And he runs to the uh, Sirkachi train station. Sirkachi is the station of the Orient Express. Okay, uh, very, you know, in front of the Bosphorus. So he goes there and he runs away. Actually, I'm, 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 I'm jumping, uh, I'm, I'm missing one thing which is important before, before these massacres. Uh, it's an important detail. Before leaving, before these massacres happening, he did a trip to Baku. Now this trip was very important. He left from Constantinople to, to Poti, I think, which is in Georgia, by boat. And then he took a, a train to Tbilisi, it was called Tiflis in those days. And um, he saw the Tsar, he was there in, in, in Tiflis. And then he moved on to Baku. In Baku, that was all the oil was coming out of Baku, the European oil. There was no Norway then. So it was, um, it was Baku, the, the place to be. And it was you know, a crazy place. Um, there were oil wells everywhere and the, the, there was a lot of waste, you know, wells where the oil was jumping out and they couldn't stop it. So it was, you know, like rain, black rain in, in Baku going on. And so it was a crazy thing. And the, the, the person who showed him around was a guy called, maybe never, never heard about him, but it's, it's an important guy. His name was Nobel. Was a, no, this guy, actually, it wasn't uh, Alfred. It was his nephew. The Nobels were involved in oil in, in, uh, in Baku. Actually, there were three groups mainly. The Nobels, the Rothschilds, and small entrepreneurs, okay? People who were buying some small plots and uh, were taking the oil from, the, from that. So, Nobel showed him around the place. This is the, the oil area, this is a... Uh, Gorodgrad, which is the black city where the, the, the conditions of, of life were terrible. And he showed them Villa Petrolia, which is a city that Nobels uh, built with all perfect conditions there. It had a school, it had a hospital, you know, proper uh, places for the workers to be. Totally different from Gorodgrad, which was a very, very awful place. And um, so Gubekin saw this. And 
he introduced him a very important man, an Armenian from Russia called Matashov. Now, Matashov, he had a funny story. He was a giant and a brutal man. He was an orderly of a Russian general. And that general, he went to, to Baku, and they brought Matashov with him. And Matashov, he loved farming. And his dream was to have a small land, a small plot, where he could farm some potatoes. So Matashov, with some money, and it wasn't, the, the property wasn't that expensive in Baku, so he bought a small plot. And guess what? One day, he did not show up in the, in, the, in the military barracks. The general is upset, you know, where is Matashov? He asked for Matashov, where are you? And uh, he calls for him, and Matashov says, I'm not working for you anymore. Why? Because I found oil in my plot. So Matashov, he found oil, okay? So he, and he became instantly rich. And this is a very brutal man, as I said. And uh, so he, he started buying uh, different plots, and he built a palace in Baku, and the palace was covered in gold. He did that. <laughs> of course, there was some riots later on, and uh, the, the rioters attacked the palace and stole all his gold. So it was not such a good idea, but uh, it was this crazy fellow. And Gulbenkian met this chap. So you can see small Gulbenkian and tall Mantashov. The two Armenians, one from, the, from Constantinople, the other one from Moscow, but... Okay, and one very, very delicate, and the other one a brute. But he, he, he met him, uh, Nobel introduced him, uh, and that was it. So when there was the massacres took place, and he was running away from Sirkachi train station with his son in a rug, okay, with his wife running away for his life. Guess what happens? He goes, uh, he stops uh, after after he leaves the Ottoman Empire. He stops in a place to catch a boat, okay. And a, a, a ship that belonged to his father-in-law, Mr. Essayan. And when the ship is about to leave, there is a man running, okay, to catch the ship. And the ship is full. And that man is Matashov. So Gobegin says to the captain, stop the boat. That man has to get inside. So they bring, the, they bring it. There's no place. It doesn't work. He should come in. So Matashov gets in, into, into the ship. Of course, he was running also for his life because he, uh, the, the massacres were, were going on. He apparently had killed some two or three Turks with his own hands. This was a giant, but he could not kill, kill all of them. So he had to run for his life. And um, what happened was he was in, in a ship. The ship was overcrowded. And they said, well, we have to find a, ca a cabin for, for Matashov. And the captain said, there are no cabins available. So you know what Gulbenkian did? He said to his wife and his one-year-old boy, or I, I don't think it was even one-year-old, you get out of the cabin for Matashov to get in. Yeah. Beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of the cabin. You know, Matashov must come in. Are you crazy? That's what his wife says in the bar. You know, are you crazy? Why? Why am I going to get out? You know, I'm a woman, I have a child here, I'm your wife, and you want that brute to come inside? <laughs> yes, because that brute is our future. So... Uh, I have to treat him well, okay? So eventually he kicks off his wife <laughs> and child from the cabin and gets inside the brute. And of course he, he does everything, the brute wants something to eat and he goes to the cooker, he wants some Ar Armenian dish and he goes and, and, uh, and convinces the, the, the cooker to, to do some Armenian dish and everything he wants, he gets. And of course they become friends and Matashov is very important because he was the... As, as I said, in Baku, there were three main producers, the Nobels, <laughs> the Rothschilds, and the small producers. And Matashov was the leader of the small producers. So Gobenkin convinced him that he, should, he Gobenkin, should be their representative in London. Because London, that's where the, the market is. Okay? If you want to sell goods, that's the place to be, and he needed someone. So he convinced him. He was so nice, he left him in his cabin. Why, well, well, why not? And he got a commission out of that, a very good commission. So that's how he got into the oil business, really. You know, not only the technology and stuff, you know, he was actually get, grabbing a hand on, on, on oil. He got a percentage of all the oil from the, the, the independent produ uh, producers in, in Baku. Uh, Gobenkian got a percentage of that. And that's how he became to be uh, a very, a very rich man. So... While in London, because he was doing business, he was meeting 
other people from, from the oil business. So he met this, this Dutch guy that, was, uh, that he always got, was getting richer and richer all the time. Um, and with, with Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, he creates a company because he knew out of his prospection that he did for the Sultan that in the in the Ottoman Empire there were surely a lot of oil waiting to be discovered so he created a company called Turkish uh, Petroleum Company where he got a grab you know uh, it, it was very difficult to get a concession to, to, to export the oil but he got it from the, the Grand Vizier in, in, in Constantinople he gave him the rights of, uh, of exploring the oil for that company, Turkish Petroleum Company. And the Turkish Petroleum Company was uh, made up of uh, Royal Dutch, they had a share, uh, uh, the Deutsche Bank, because the Germans were involved in, 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 a, in, a, in a railway line, an Ottoman uh, line, and they were, they were an important part of it, so they got them. Uh, Winston Churchill demanded because there was no British interest there, apart from Shell in a way, but it demanded that uh, Anglo-Persian got a, got a percentage of that too, which is now BP. So he managed to get BP and another share was for Mr. Gobenkin. Okay, that's the Turkish Petroleum Company. Now this, this, this creation became very important later on, as, uh, as I, I'm, I'm going to explain to you in, in a few moments. So. When they are prepared to start looking for the oil, the Great War breaks. Okay, and you cannot export oil in in in, in the Ottoman Empire anymore because it's a British company and a, a Dutch company. And Gobenkini was living in London. Only the Germans were there, so everything was sort of suspended. Now, at this stage of the book, I had to move into more a bit uh, to fictionalize a little bit more. Why? Gulbenkian, he did not witness the genocide. He was living in London. Okay? His son, Nubar, grew up. He was already in his 20s. He was studying at a German university. Uh, actually, he left Germany just a few days before the declaration of war. He went to, to England because he could not stay there since he was a British citizen. Oh, sorry, a citizen, uh, British subject. Um, so, uh, there was nothing actually going on with the, with the genocide. But me, as a, as a novelist, I thought, I cannot talk about an Armenian without talking about the genocide. You know, because it's something that is very... Uh, it, 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 um, it makes a mark, a very deep mark, on the lives of all Armenians, I'm sure. You cannot go through such an historic experience and not be tainted by it. So I've got to tell this story, especially because I know in my country, Portugal, not that many people know about this. We know that the word genocide was created by, after the Armenian genocide, but um, what actually happened? I knew because I had read a novel by, a, by an Armenian novelist, so I knew what, was going, what happened, but not in much detail, of course, I just read the story. Uh, and I thought that I thought that I had the duty to to tell this story. Also, because everybody knows about the Jewish Holocaust, and again, nobody knew about the Armenian uh, genocide, and uh, it, wa it was a shame. And I was aware that uh, the biggest hurt in such an event is, of course, the event in itself. But there is a, a, a second pain that comes out after it, which is if you experience this experience. And everybody ignores it, okay? You go through it and as if nobody cares. And I realize this is terrible. And uh, we sh I should write it. Because usually well, people who write about genocide are uh, Armenians. And I don't think this is an Armenian problem. This is a hu humankind problem, you know. This is a problem that we should address. It sh should worry all of us. And I thought that it's perfect if I, I have no links to Armenia, but I have a duty as a human being of telling this story. So that's where I diverse from the real events. Okay, so that's why also my character, the son of, of uh, Kalust Kubekin, in the novel, is not called Nubar, that was his real name, I changed his name for Krikov. 
So in, in the book he's Krikor. They had very fine art. And they, they started selling art from the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Okay? So Gobengin wrote to them and said, Look, I've heard you want to sell your 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 piece of art, you know, it's crazy. Uh, my advice to you, don't sell them. But if you do sell them against my advice, then sell them to me. <laughs> Why? I'll give you a lot of money. Maybe not as much as the Americans will, but I will not brag about it. If you sell to the Americans, the Americans then will start bragging about it and it will be a humiliation for you because you are selling the treasuries of Russia. It's not good for you. I will be very discreet. So you sell them to me for a good price and uh, you get the money and you don't get bad publicity. So they sold them. So we got Hambra, Mani, Muni, uh, you know, uh, Renoir, the, the biggest artist, where he's in private, in his house. Can you believe this? He was a museum. He built a house in Paris, in, uh, in uh, Avenue Diana, near the, the uh, Triumph Arch, L'Arc du Triomphe. And that house was built as a museum. He lived there, but Every spot had the own. The Rembrandt is going to be here, and the uh, Noir is going to be there. It, it was it's crazy. So he got his huge collection. Also, he was a man, as I said in the beginning, he loved luxury. His uh, father-in-law was the owner of the Pear Palace in uh, Constantinople. And uh, Gobenkian, one year, was in London. He lived in, uh, in a Savoy hotel, which was the best hotel in the world in those days. And in a Savoy, he met a guy, a Swiss guy called César Ritz. And um, he, came, he, he met César Ritz again in Paris after the war. And César Ritz said, oh, what you want to say? I'm ruined, I'm ruined. I have this dream of building this huge and beautiful, most luxurious hotel, and I have no money. And Gobinden said, OK, I believe in you. I met you in the Savoy. I know how, how good you are. I know your vision about a hotel, so Yes, you build your hotel, and uh, I'll pay for it, and I get a share. So that's, when, whenever you go to a Ritz hotel, you know it's go bank and money who did it. <laughs> Nobody knows this. There is a book about the Ritz hotel, and the, his name is not mentioned there. It's unbelievable. And yet, it, it, uh, it came from, to, to such an extent that and, until go bank and died, in every Ritz hotel in the world, there would be a suite prepared for him, for him, for, for, for him to stay at any time. Uh, and so he had this taste for, for, for luxury. And so we had this uh, discuss. We had a, he was a peculiar man with a great private collection, taste for hotels, place in the Ritz, and, um, and of course the, 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 the young girls. And the war is over. There is no more Ottoman Empire. There is Turkey. There is Iraq. There is um, Saudi Arabia. No more Tur no Ottoman Empire, remember? And they find oil in Kirkuk, in Iraq, which is under the contract, uh, the, the concession given by the Grand Vizier to the Turkish Petroleum Company. So suddenly they get a lot of money because it's Anglo-Persian actually who finds the oil in Kirkuk, but the, all oil that belongs to one group belongs to everybody under the, the, the terms of the agreement with the Grand Vizier. Of course, the Deutsche Bank is not there anymore. So they put inside, in the place of the, of the Deutsche Bank, they put inside um, the Americans, which were, of course, they, they realized there was a lot of oil going on there in the Ottoman Empire, especially Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Um, and they put there, and Gobenkian came up with an idea, I have to give the, something for the French, because I live in Paris. Mm -hmm. So he created a company, which is, we know now as El Fakitaine. This is a creation of, of uh, no, actually, I think they, they changed the name, Total, Total, okay, so when you see Total, that's a creation of, of Gobekian. He created that, he was an architect. He's the, the, the architect of the entire European oil, entire, exception, of course, Norway, uh, oil business. It's important to stress that. Uh, anyway, um, so they find oil in Kirkuk, and then they find in Mosul, and then they find in other places, in Saudi Arabia. But he, it's so much oil that it is, he realizes he cannot have his 15% share. So he gives a little bit to the Americans, he gives a little bit for the French, 
and he ends up with 5%. So all money that comes out of the entire oil that, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, 5% goes to Kalusko Beykian. Now, 5% does not seem much, but <laughs> I assure you, it was a lot of money. He was the richest man in the world, was richer than Rockefeller. That's how he ended up. Uh, so we get to the Second World War. He's living in Paris, comfortably, in his house, which is actually a museum with the best collection in the world, and the Germans arrive. If you watch that movie with uh, George Clooney, The Monuments Man, you understand that the Germans were after the paintings. And yet they didn't touch his paintings, because I believe, and there are some historians who believe too, that he bribed the Germans. It's bribery. Traditional, um, I'm sure he got the, 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 the concession out of the Grand Vizier, not because the Grand Vizier thought he was nice, actually he was nice, but in another way. <laughs> but, you know, he got it. So the Germans did not touch his uh, Rembrandts and uh, Renoir, they didn't touch anything. Um, and he was related to the Shah, he was giving advice to the Shah of, per of Persia against Anglo-Persian, which, which is BP now because they were rivals. So he was undermining the British. And uh, he was telling them, he's giving information to the, to, to the Shah, not, how not to be explored by Anglo-Persian and the tricks that Anglo-Persian came up to, to get more money than they should out of, of Iran. And so um, the Shah gave him a post as a diplomat in, in Paris too. So he was linked to, to, to Persia. And of course, when the Germans arrive after coming, uh, striking to deal with the Germans not to touch his collection, he leaves with the with the Persian delegation to Vichy. Okay, he goes to Vichy. He lives in a huge hotel. They, I think he lived in the hotel where where Marshal Pétain lived, the president of France, then, um, as a diplomat of Persia. But then Persia gets into the war on the side of the, of, of the Allies because under British pressure and, and Russian pressure too. So, um, the French say, the Vichy French say, you know, you cannot stay anymore because you are now an ally and we cannot antagonize the Germans. They are here, they are occupying our country. So he has to leave. And he comes up, you know, I have to leave, but where, where to? The obvious choice that he thought of was Switzerland, neutral Switzerland. You know, the banks and lakes and uh, all that stuff, why not? But there was a bug. First, the, the Swiss government was not very keen on it. And second, um, there was German, Germany next to Switzerland. And hmm, he got some information that maybe the Germans want to take over Switzerland too. So it's not a solution. So he's thinking about what, what, what the hell am I going to do? And his son, Nubar, um, he was, he was doing work for Bleachley, the Secret Service, the British Secret Service. He was, he, uh, MI6 was using uh, Nubar as a courier to bring information from London to Vichy and back. Especially he was, uh, they were organizing how to extract uh, Royal Air Force RAF uh, pilots that were uh, falling in, in, in France, the, how to extract them from, from France. And Nubar was uh, being a Korean. How did they get from London to Vichy? Could not fly directly. They would go to Lisbon. And when Nubar got to Lisbon, he saw a city, you know, in those days, including here in, in, in Norway, everything was dark, you know. It was actually literally dark. No lights were allowed in the evening. It was the darkness of war, and the darkness of Nazism, and of, co of course nobody could have lights in the evening. And Lisbon, it was leading a normal life. There were lights everywhere, like a, a Christmas tree. And um, everything was there, there was luxury. All royalty in Europe was in, in, in Lisbon. Okay, the, we had this huge uh, hotel, luxury hotel called Hotel Palacio, which is in Sturil. Sturil is the Portuguese uh, um, yeah. uh, Riviera, okay? So it's casinos and hotels and beaches. And it's very close to Lisbon. By the way, Lisbon is a uh, the only capital in Europe where you can go to the beach 20 minutes away. It's 20 minutes away, you go to the beach. <laughs> and so you go to Sturil or Cascais. It's a very nice, very nice area. And all royalty was there. Okay, so he was impressed. Uh, Ian Fleming, he was in, a, in, a, in a Hotel Palacio. 
that's where he created uh, James Bond. Okay, the, the Casino Royale is actually the studio casino. And uh, he was impressed. So when, when um, Nubar, this problem came up, he said to his father, why don't you go to Lisbon? Well, why, why Lisbon? Well, you know, you know, life is normal there. You like it, you like luxury. They have these lux luxurious areas and it's stable. They have this dictator, Salazar, and everything is stable. And uh, it's on the way to America. You know, if you watch Casablanca, the movie, you'll see the final scene, you know, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, and uh, she, uh, she says, I'm going to, to Lisbon now, and uh, Humphrey Bogart asks, what's in Lisbon for you? And she says, the clipper to America. It's because there was the, the clipper, the, 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 the hydroplane, that came from America, from Pan Am, it would, uh, uh, you know, sea land in Lisbon, and they would come out, you know, and all intellectuals and actors were going through Europe, through, through Lisbon, or back to, or backwards, whatever, you know. Anyone who wanted to get inside Europe or outside of Europe would go through Lisbon, because it was not at war. And you, uh, nearby the, the port area, what is now, what is now the, the expo area, uh, the, that, that's where the, the clipper was, and you could find a lot of Rolls Royces and Mercedes just left uh, there. It was the Jews who were running from the Germans, the rich Jews, bankers and stuff. They were running, they came in, in, in Mercedes and Rolls Royce and they left them there to catch the Clipper to America. Okay? And of course, uh, this, these are the rich Jews, there were the poor Jews too, there were a lot of them there. There are very interesting stories about that too, you know. Um, it was crowded, Lisbon was crowded with Jews. And they've changed um, a lot of things in Portugal, by the way, just for being there. For example, the, the, we have the central square, which is called Rocio in Lisbon. Rocio. Rocio is like your, your square here in, the, in front of the Grand, the Grand Hotel. Okay? It's like the uh, Republic Square in Yerevan for the Armenians. So it's the central, really central square, and there are the cafes around. And, uh, you know, the Jewish girls from Paris, from Budapest, from all over Europe, they would go there and they started, they were showing their knees. And oh, wow, they, no women could show their knees in Portugal. And so you could see, for example, they were, they were in cafes, uh, on, in one cafe in Rousseau, and on the other side of Rousseau, you would see a, a bunch of Portuguese men looking at the, at the legs of the foreign girls. You know, and uh, th that's how the Esplanades actually were born because these girls said, oh, the, the weather is so nice here, why do you have the tables inside? Get them out. And so that's how the Esplanades were born in Portugal. So they, they, they had an impact. So this is the kind of Lisbon that, that existed. And um, Gulbenkian gets convinced, okay, not, not because of the, the knees, uh, of course, <laughs> but uh, it's on the way to America. He's, my son is saying it's nice, so he goes to Lisbon. He goes to this luxury. His wife, Nunufa, is uh, sorry, Nevart. She goes to Hotel Palacio in Estoril, but he stays in Hotel Aviche, which is a luxurious hotel in in central Lisbon. It doesn't exist anymore. I wish the the, the mayor who decided to destroy it would be shot, uh, because it's really a crime. It does not exist anymore. And now it's the Sheraton Hotel there, which is an ugly building uh, instead of that historic, but uh, sorry, building like the the. The, the Avige Hotel, so that's where he stayed. And um, he said, you know, I'm, I'm here for some time, but, um, you know, after maybe a few months I'll go away. And he was staying and staying, and suddenly he started liking the, the Portuguese people, because um, in Portugal people are very friendly to foreigners. Actually, we are even friendlier to foreigners than to ourselves. <laughs> um, the Portuguese actually re 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 resembled the Armenians in a way, um, and, and very importantly, Lisbon looked like Constantinople. I don't know uh, those of you who know Istanbul or and Lisbon, but if you know both cities, you will you will notice that they are very similar. Uh, uh, Constantinople, seven hills city, Lisbon, seven hills city, where in 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 Constantinople there, there is the Bosphorus. In Lisbon, there is the Tagus River, which is very wide, and then we have the the, the, the ocean. And uh, in Constantinople, the Marmor Sea, it's very, very similar. And that's something that Gobekli immediately noticed. Uh, Lisbon brought him to his childhood. 
you know, he remembered when he was a kid. And there were no Turks around. So he was, you know, he was comfortable about it. And uh, he was staying there. 